Nearly 900 years ago, the Holy Land was home to one of the most extraordinary organizations that has ever existed. The Knights of the Temple of Solomon were elite warriors, unparalleled entrepreneurs, and devoted men of God. Ready at any moment to kill and die, they had one mission, to defend the Christian Holy Land. After a severe mauling by the legendary Islamic leader Saladin, the Knights Templar had mobilized their enormous financial resources in Western Europe. Frontline defenses had been reconstructed and garrisoned. But how long could the outnumbered Templars hold out against an enemy that had all the logistical advantages? And just how dangerous were their opponents back in Western Europe, envious of their land and wealth? A knight of the Temple of Solomon, recruited in Europe and sent to the front line in the Holy Land, soon became hardened to the conditions of the East. As monks of the Catholic Church, they were well accustomed to strict discipline, and their every moment, awake and asleep, was regulated. Each day was taken up with prayer, work, and above all, constant training for battle. There was no leisure time, and, in fact, most of the time there was not much battle either. Warfare was expensive in men and horses, and for decades the order had generally pursued a cautious policy in the East. This policy had even included negotiating truces with local Islamic leaders, which made other crusaders deeply uneasy, especially when they negotiated with the leader of a Shi'i Muslim sect called the Assassins. The Templars had no qualms in implementing any policy that strengthened their position in the East. They're not just professional soldiers. The Templars are the professional defenders of the frontier. And that's more than just military. It has to be diplomatic. It has to be political and so on. So maybe this is why the Templars picked up on the possibility of an alliance with the assassins more readily than did the secular rulers of the Crusader states. Pilgrims and crusaders visiting the Holy Land for the first time were often angry to discover that the resident crusaders had negotiated a truce with the Muslim enemy. They had spent a great deal of money to get there and had traveled far. Newly arrived travelers could not believe that any Christians, especially the Templars, even talked to the Muslims. Fundamentally, they were intolerant on an everyday basis. For much of the time, they had to be tolerant. It's just a matter of um, common sense and, and ability to exist. These people are not stupid. They, their beliefs were intolerant, much more intolerant than ours are today. But they were living, as I said, on a frontier. They had to deal with their neighbors. They were not in a position to wage perpetual war. They knew it, their leaders knew it, everybody knew it. So pragmatism, I won't say was the order of the day, but they were perfectly willing and capable of being pragmatic. This does not make them different to other medieval people. So there were many day-to-day -day contacts between all the Franks in the East, and some of these are very colourfully described by a Damascene chronicler called Usama ibn Munkid. One, one of these stories is... The, the most well-known one, about a Frank newly arrived from the West who forces Usama to pray facing East. And one of the Templars intervenes 
apologizes to, to Usama and says, no, uh, this man is, 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 a, is, a, is a newcomer, he doesn't understand our ways, um, you, you can pray in whatever way you wish. And this has sometimes been presented as showing that the Templars were very friendly with the Muslims. But I think it's really, it shows much more that in daily life, Templars and other Franks had frequent contact with the Muslims. Many of them spoke Arabic, many more than has been previously said spoke Arabic, I think. Um, so there were, it was necessary uh, in order to exist to have these daily contacts. But that doesn't necessarily affect their commitment to the Holy War. Although the Templars had time and time again proved themselves to be dedicated enemies of Islam, there would always be rumors that they fraternized with the enemy. One day, the Templars would actually be accused of secretly being Muslims themselves. By joining the Order of the Temple of Solomon, a knight believed he was purifying himself of the corruption, temptation, and superficialities of the transitory world. As such, he was to lead a hard-working, sober life of sacrifice, dedication, and humility. For humility is the guardian of all virtues but few people ever saw much humility in the Templars. As individuals, the Templars stood apart with their white robes and red cross. As an organization, the Order of the Temple of Solomon prized its independence. Templar castles ruled their surrounding areas with complete autonomy. They brought little or no interference from the king. The temple often pursued its own strategies, even in direct opposition to the overall crusader policy. Early in the 13th century, the Christian enclave in the Holy Land stretched from Antioch to Assur, and the Templars now controlled a major proportion of this from their castles at Atlet, Chastel Blanc, and in the mountains around Antioch. The undying aim of all the Crusaders remained the capture of Jerusalem for Christianity. The next opportunity arrived with the Fifth Crusade, whose leaders believed that the only way to secure Jerusalem was by first conquering Egypt itself. The Templars joined the Fifth Crusade, whose objective was Egypt's capital, Cairo. The city of Damietta was the first obstacle facing the Crusaders. The Christian siege of Damietta was long and bitter, but finally the Crusaders overwhelmed the Muslims. This so shocked the Sultan of Egypt that he immediately offered to surrender the Kingdom of Jerusalem if they would return the captured city and leave. The Christians hesitated. They were expecting reinforcements from Emperor Frederick II, who had vowed to go on crusade. If Frederick's forces arrived in time, Cairo itself would be an attainable goal. While the Christians hesitated, the Muslims prepared their defenses. Twenty months after the capture of Damietta, the Fifth Crusade finally headed south. The Egyptians easily cut their supply line and flooded the valley. The Christians accepted the Sultan's next offer. They returned Damietta and he let them escape with their lives. The failure of Emperor Frederick II to arrive in the Holy Land almost certainly resulted in the destruction of the Fifth Crusade. Frederick eventually went on crusade, 
in 1228, but was forced to turn back because of illness, and the papacy excommunicated him um, as a result. Frederick wasn't deterred by this. He then set out again, but this very much complicated his relations with the powers that already existed in Cyprus and on the mainland when he arrived there, and it became rather difficult for them to have dealings with him in the long term. Moreover, Frederick expected his own will to be obeyed. He had a quasi-absolutist regime in the Kingdom of Sicily, which is one of the important parts of his empire, and he found it difficult to deal with military orders, accustomed to being at least semi-independent, and a Jerusalem baronage, which had a very highly developed sense of its legal rights. So from the very beginning, Frederick was in conflict with important powers in the East, and this included the Templars. As an order of the Catholic Church, the Templars were not supposed to have dealings with the excommunicated Frederick, but their conflict with the German Emperor had begun much earlier. Back in Europe, Frederick had angrily complained that the Templar network had purchased so much of his lands in Italy that it was trying to control his entire kingdom. After quarrelling with the Crusaders in the east, Frederick II headed down the coast and actually met with the Sultan of Egypt. At the city of Jaffa, he signed a sensational treaty. The Egyptians voluntarily ceded back part of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, including the holy city itself, to the Christians. Almost single-handedly and without bloodshed, the excommunicate German Emperor had finally recovered Jerusalem for Christianity. Frederick then went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and had himself crowned. The Christians resident in the West, especially the Templars, were not impressed with Frederick's achievement as one of the clauses of the treaty prevented the repair of any fortifications in and around the Holy City. There does seem thereafter to have been a period of enmity between the military orders, um, particularly between uh, Frederick II and the Templars, um, which resulted in a number of confiscations of Templar lands in Frederick's lands in Italy when he returned um, to the West in 1229. One of the consequences of the enmity between Frederick and the Templars was the Templars' refusal to accept the treaties that Frederick had signed. And indeed there are some sources that claim, I think wrongly, but claim that there was a plot to murder Frederick and that the Templars were involved in that plot. His approach was one of attempted coexistence on what we believe to have been a long-term basis. He was trying to achieve peace in a true sense of it, whereas what the Templars had done in the past in terms of coexistence was temporary. They were making sort of strategic uh, truces and so on. So their approach was fundamentally different. Frederick's negotiation with the Egyptian had greatly increased the Crusaders' territory in the Holy Land. Over the next few years, further Crusades by Theobald of Champagne and Richard of Cornwall used both military action and negotiation to increase the Christian state to the largest it had been for 50 years. Despite the apparent success of the Crusader state, the Knights Templar still refused to acknowledge Frederick's treaty with the Sultan of Egypt, and they steadfastly pursued their own policies. The Templars opened negotiation with Egypt's rival, the Sultan of Damascus. The Templars believed the Egyptian empire was growing weak, a situation they felt the Crusaders should be exploiting to the full. The fact is that 
the Muslim states of that region had other and far more important things to worry about, most obviously the Mongols, who, unlike the Crusaders, did pose a mortal threat, um, certainly were perceived as posing a mortal threat to the Muslim world, to the whole civilization of Islam. It was on an entirely different level, com even compared with the First Crusade. The Mongol Empire, created by Genghis Khan, had expanded across half a continent and now threatened the Islamic and Christian states. Fleeing the Mongol horde was an army called the Khwarezm, who also posed a grave threat to the Christian state. The westernmost Islamic leader, the Sultan of Damascus, felt most threatened and he had accepted a non-aggression treaty with the Templars in which he gave them back their old castle of Safad. The Sultan of Egypt was stunned and immediately allied himself with the Khwarezm. The Crusader state was surrounded. The Khwarezm struck first, invading Palestine and attacking Damascus. The Christians assembled the largest force they could and together with the Sultan of Damascus took the field at La Forbi. Their Muslim allies deserted and the Egyptians crushed the Christians in one of the most devastating battles of the century. Ninety percent of the Templar force in the Holy Land had been killed at the Battle of La Forbi. But many Christians, especially Frederick II, squarely blamed the Knights Templar for the catastrophe. The crisis deepened over the next few years as the weakened Crusader state lost some of its most powerful castles. Frederick accused the Templars of perpetuating war for their own ends. He claimed that the military order could not exist in peace, and that's why they had sabotaged his treaty with the Egyptians. Frederick was not the first to accuse the Knights Templar of warmongering, and he would not be the last. The King of France, Louis IX, was the first to respond to the Crusaders' frantic pleas for help. Louis arrived in the East in 1248 with a diverse contingent of European knights. Louis decided to follow the strategy of previous Crusades, attempting to knock out Egypt before taking Jerusalem. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to attack Egypt because of the Nile, because of the series of canals that crisscrossed the various branches of the Nile and one couldn't necessarily move one's army across these branches all in one go. And there was one very important incident when the Templars together with the Earl of Salisbury and Robert of Artois who was a younger brother of King Louis IX of France had already crossed one branch of the Nile and were opposite the Egyptian town of Mansoura. Robert of Artois, keen to gain glory, wanted to attack Mansoura. It would appear that the Templars wished to adopt their usual rather cautious policy and wait for the rest of the army. But when Robert of Artois insisted, using, as one chronicler said, foul and abusive words that were characteristic of the French, the Templars agreed to go along with this. But it proved to be a disaster because Mansoura was a town with small, tight streets, quite inappropriate for a mounted attack of the sort that the Count of Artois and the Templars were forced to make. And many of them were trapped in these narrow streets and were killed. So by the time the bulk of the army appeared, this had turned from what was planned to be a glorious attack into a rout.
The disaster of Mansurah had seen the entire vanguard of the Crusader army eliminated. Whatever the motivation for the Templar assault on Montserrat, the Templars had found themselves central to yet another catastrophe. They had lost 200 knights and another Grand Master had been killed in battle. The retreating Christians were eventually surrounded and Louis IX, the King of France, surrendered to the Egyptian Sultan. He was put up for an enormous ransom of 400,000 livres de tour, at a time when the annual income of the entire Kingdom of France was 250,000 livres. Templar treasure ships waiting offshore were targeted by the king's entourage, but the Templars refused to release the money, as much of it had been deposited with them for safekeeping by other crusaders. In fact, there wasn't any obvious conflict. A member of the king's entourage broke the locks of some of these um, trunks of money in the presence of the Templars who made a symbolic objection. In that way, the Templars managed to maintain their integrity while still making a contribution towards the king's ransom. Immediately on his release, Louis went to the Crusader city of Acre where he remained for four years. Despite the Templars' support for the French king, they would not abandon their own policies in the Holy Land. While Louis hoped to make peace with Egypt, he caught the Templars negotiating once more with the Muslim city of Damascus. Louis was shocked and forced the Templars to submit and repent. When Louis IX eventually sailed for home, the Christian Holy Land lost not just his substantial resources, but also one of the few leaders who could unify the state and keep the Templars in line. Not long after, the Crusaders' situation took a turn for the worse. The Mongols were on the move again, and Egypt had undergone a coup, and a new power, the Mamluks, began carving an empire for itself. The Mamluks recognized the Mongols to be a far greater threat than the Christians. By the year 1260, the Mongols had sacked Baghdad, Aleppo and Damascus leaving no Islamic power east of the Christians. The ever-diminishing sliver of the Christian Holy Land stood between the world's two most powerful armies. Incredibly, the Crusaders allowed the Muslims to pass through their land en route to the Mongol hordes. At the Battle of An Jalut, it was the Mamluks who were victorious, inflicting the first major defeat on the Mongol Empire. The Crusader leaders quickly made peace with the victorious Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, but the Templars and the Hospitallers refused to hand over their lucrative Muslim prisoners of war. The Mamluks immediately retaliated. The Mamluk advance was slow, but methodical and relentless. The last campaigns of the crusading epic in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, are campaigns of siege warfare. The crusaders are in their castles, in their fortified cities. In fact, essentially in their fortified cities, we can um, almost forget the castles of this last few decades. And the Muslim armies are seeking to take these powerfully defended, strongly walled, fortified cities and a few castles. Siege warfare is slow. The, it's before gunpowder, of course. So even though the Muslim armies were extremely sophisticated in this kind of warfare, it was a slow process. In the early 1260s, the Mamluk concentrated on the southern Christian lands. In the late 1260s, they took Antioch and the Templars abandoned the enclave. 
In the 1270s, the Tripoli enclave crumbled. Only the arrival of Prince Edward of England, the future Edward I, with 10,000 Mongol allies, enabled a decade-long truce. But before the truce was up, the Mamluks decided to finish the Christians once and for all. In 1290, the Mamluks assembled 60,000 cavalry, 160,000 infantry, and 100 Manganel siege engines around the Christian capital of Acre. The temple compound was the last building to fall, and the Grand Master and all the remaining Templars were killed in the fighting. On August 14, 1291, the Knights Templars evacuated their last standing castle at Atlit and set up their new headquarters on Cyprus. The Templar castle of Atlid was the greatest they had ever built and had never been taken by siege. The Mamluks demolished it, so it could never again be used against the forces of Islam. The destruction of the last crusader stronghold on the Holy Land was proof to many in the West that God no longer approved of such violence. By the 13th century, the crusading ideal was recognized as something of a dream, an impossible dream. There were many who liked the idea as a sort of romantic, epic, heroic, religious concept. But as far as large numbers of the knightly elite, the educated classes and the rising bourgeoisie of the towns wanting to make sacrifices for this, the idea had become impractical. So I think it would be quite fair to say that the Templars and the other crusading orders were left high and dry. The Knights Templar were now more vulnerable than they could possibly imagine. Their entire reason for being was the defense of the Holy Land, and they had failed. But the Templars were still an order of the Catholic Church. Any move against the Templars would be a direct assault on the papacy itself. While the order of the Temple mustered its forces once more for yet another crusade against the Muslims, storm clouds were gathering back in Europe. The order of the Temple of Solomon was about to find itself caught in the middle of a cataclysmic power struggle that would shake Western Europe the very core. Cool.